Father, I pray once again that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'll never forget the day we were sitting in a class. It was a class on the Pentateuch, Genesis through Deuteronomy. The professor was an Old Testament scholar, and um, he was lecturing, and we were, of course, writing down things as fast as we could, as you do in classes like that. And all of a sudden, you know, I have my head down, I'm writing, and he stops talking. And I'm waiting, we're all waiting, he stops talking. And I, I have this sense of, or sort of, the 20 some of us in the class, just our heads collectively coming up and wondering what's going on. And this professor is standing there behind this lectern and looking out the window. He's just staring out the window. Of course, we're all thinking, what's going on here? Is he having a physical problem? Is there something happening here? We don't know what to do. He just kept staring out the window. It seemed like 10 minutes, but surely it wasn't that long. But you know, when you're, do, when you're in that setting, 30 or 45 seconds seems like a long time. And finally, we all just turned and looked out the window, this bank of windows, to see what in the world he's looking at. There was a field out there, and just above the field was this beautiful rainbow. And he couldn't take his eyes off of it. I thought at one point that maybe he was actually going to break into tears. He was so moved by this rainbow. He just stared at it for probably two minutes. And I remember thinking at the time, well, that's great, but I, I don't understand why that makes him so emotional. I don't understand why he's so enthralled. You see rainbows all the time. But there was something about the fact that he had studied the Old Testament. There was something about in him that that, that rainbow grabbed him in a way that it didn't grab me and I think most of my classmates. But in the years since, I think I'm beginning, just beginning to understand maybe his experience. And I've been thinking a lot about that as we come to this ending part of Noah's story. But Noah's story doesn't start, this part of it doesn't really start at the rainbow. It starts back in the end of chapter 8. At the end of chapter 8, after the flood is done, God says, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans. Even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood, never again will I destroy all living creatures as I've done. In chapter 9, he says, God said to Noah and his sons with him, never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And when you read that, there is a sense in which what God is saying is, I'm going to have to try something different. Now, I don't know what that does for your theology, and I don't know that I can totally explain it theologically, but all I know is God says here, I've tried this strategy from Adam to Noah, and it ended in such a disaster that if I didn't interact, if I didn't do something drastic, the whole earth would have just destroyed itself. And so now, I'm going to try something different. Now, I think part of the reason God tries something different is because of who we are as human beings. Let's be honest, we just don't get it. We just keep failing. We just keep struggling. We keep rejecting. We keep going our own way. The reason the world ended up the way it was, where every heart was was given over to evil and violence and wickedness was the primary description of the earth, is because human beings wanted that. It shouldn't surprise us that God changes his strategy because I'll just 
just stand over here. So, you know, we, we sometimes think that, that Jesus told a parable in Matthew chapter 21 about a landowner who uh, built a vineyard, built a wall around it, set it all up, and then he entrusted it to people to, to do it, to run the vineyard. And he said, I'll, send, I'll come back and get what's mine when the harvest is done. And so when the harvest time comes, he sends a servant. And the people who had rented the land and worked it said, why should we give him anything? And they beat the servant and send him home. So he sends more servants. And they beat them and send them home. And so he sends different servants. And they beat them and kill, they kill some of them. And finally he says, all right, I've got to change strategy. I'll send my son. But you know, though this, this problem is partly because of who we are as human beings. It's, I think it's predominantly because of who God is. God refuses to give up on his creation. God will not give up on his desire for his creation to live in shalom and to be reconciled and to know the joy of life in him. And he will not give up on that. And he will keep trying everything possible to get people to live in that and to see it and to embrace it. Karl Barth once said, our sin is never so potent that it can escape God's grace. And that's true. God's grace continues. God keeps working and moving in every one of our lives individually. He uses different strategies for every one of us because he knows that there are different ways in which our eyes are going to be opened and we're going to see and respond. And he does that in a wider scope as well because God's ultimate purpose is always restoration and reconciliation and bringing shalom to what he creates. But it doesn't always look like that. You think about the flood, the story of the flood. It looks like God is acting not in grace but in vengeance. It looks like God is saying, look, you want to treat me that way? I'll show you what happens. You know, of all the animals, creatures on the earth, there are no creatures that I hate more than snakes. Actually, that's not right. Hate isn't a strong enough word to describe my feelings for snakes. Whatever the strongest word you can think of, that's getting close to how I feel about snakes. I hate snakes. I don't even like looking at snakes, pictures of snakes in books. And even as I'm talking to you about this now, the hair on the back of my neck standing up a little bit, I just don't, I hate snakes. I don't you know if there was an animal that could have been left off the ark, I would have been fine if it was snakes. I don't know, I don't understand, you know, scientifically how snakes fit into the ecosystem of our world, but I would be willing to sacrifice whatever it is to get rid of snakes. <laughs> I, I mean, I, it's just my feel. There is no good, no good snake but a dead snake, in my opinion. That's just me, you know? And when I, when, and when I get rid of them, it's like, oh, yes, good. And I think there's something in the back of our minds that's, that, and the evil one tells us, that's how God feels about you and your sinfulness. That's how God feels about the world. That's why the flood came, because God said, I'm sick and tired of you people. I hate you people. I'm going to do something about it. You mess with me, this is what's going to happen. But that's not God. God doesn't feel joy and satisfaction when the flood is done. He grieves. In the depths of his being, he grieves. Because of human sin and and human destruction that makes this the only solution to save the earth. You know, there are other stories. There are other flood stories in the ancient Near Eastern uh, nations. They're very different. One of the reasons I, I think some kind of catastrophic flood really did take place because all these other nations outside of Israel have flood stories. 
They just try to explain it in the way that they know how. One of the stories says that the reason the flood comes is because the gods are so irritated with human beings because there's so many of them and they're so noisy that the human beings keep the gods up at night and they can't sleep. And so they're like, I'm tired of this. Let's wipe them out. And then they grieve. But they grieve now, not because of human destruction. They grieve because all of a sudden they realize how short-sighted they've been because the humans feed them. The only way the gods get food is because the humans feed them and they've removed them. And they grieve because who's going to feed us now? We weren't thinking this through. Yahweh doesn't grieve like that. He grieves for every single person who has to suffer. He grieves that the earth has reached this point, that he has to act in this way. And the last word of the gods of the ancient Near East is selfishness. The last word of God is grace. It's always grace. And that's why God says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to make a covenant with you. A covenant's an interesting thing. It's, it's something that is both legal and relational. Probably the, maybe the, one of the closest things we have in our world of a covenant would be marriage. Two people stand in front of others and they declare their vows to each other, I do, I will, and at the end of that ceremony, at some point they sign a piece of paper, an official document that says, we did this. But we all know that a marriage isn't held together because there's a legal document in a filing cabinet somewhere in the, in the state capitol. That's not what holds a marriage together. What holds a marriage together is love and trust. What holds a marriage together is the relationship of it, not the legal dynamic of it. And there is a big difference between legal things and these relational covenants. One rabbi says that a contract is transactional, but a covenant is relational. A contract is, is talking about people's, identi- people's interests, but a covenant is talking about people's identity. And a contract is moving toward, so what are the benefits I'm going to get from this? But a covenant is thinking about transformation. And God says to Noah, God says to to them, I want to make a covenant with you. Isn't it a phenomenal thing when the creator God, the almighty God, says to fallible, frail human beings, I want to enter into a covenant with you. I want to bind myself to you. You can ponder that to the end of your life and never come to the end of it that the Almighty God would want relationship with his creation so much that he would say, I'm going, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to humble myself to enter into covenant with you. And the covenant comes out of, is the response to Noah's sacrifice. You ever been in um, at the airport and you uh, you're sitting there and maybe it's been your experience as well, but you're at the airport and you and a, and a flight comes in, international flight, and uh, you you get the sense that it was a pretty rough flight. I mean, it was a really rough flight. People are walking off the plane, a little dazed and staggered, and you know everybody is is uh, just sort of ashen. And they walk off that flight. And maybe some of the people have even had a difficult experience. They've been gone a while and, and it didn't go well. And now this flight. And they get off. And you ever see people get off of that flight and they get down on the ground, their hands and knees, and they kiss the ground. I have this picture in my mind of Noah and his family getting out of the ark, getting down on their hands and knees and kissing the ground. I mean, you know, months and months and months on the water. And wondering, is it ever going to recede? Is it just going to be a life in this ark? Are we going to run out of food? What's going to happen? And months and months and months of that. 
And eventually, dry ground appears, and they are, the ark comes to a rest, and they can actually open the door and step out, and it had to be an amazing experience. And what's the first thing Noah does? He makes a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice of thanksgiving. It's a sacrifice of gratitude that God brought them through, rescued them, saved them, and brought them back to dry ground. And it's an act of generosity on his part because sacrifice and generosity are tightly connected. Gratitude and and generosity are tightly connected. He takes animal. I mean, they don't know what they're going to eat. There are no crops. Nothing has grown. It will be a while before anything grows. They have limited animals that they can eat. And yet they take some of them, the clean animals, the only animals they're allowed to eat, they take those animals and he sacrifices some of them. He's so grateful. And one of the things that's been going through my mind as I ponder that, as you think about the grace of God and the goodness of God, how grateful are we for the goodness of God? You think about the times that God brings us through, how grateful are we? One of the ways that you can measure our gratitude is how generous we are with our sacrifice. When you have to wonder how grateful you really are if your level of generosity is pretty low, if your willingness to sacrifice is pretty low. If people looked at us and and we said, I'm so grateful to God, I'm so thankful to God, and they watched us in what we do with what we have, would they believe that, that we're really that grateful? And this isn't manipulating God. God doesn't say, okay, Noah, you've done enough to satisfy me. I'll make this covenant with you. It's just that God is always looking for people who want to enter into covenant with him. He's always looking for people who want relationship with him. He's always offering himself to to us to say, I want this kind of relationship with you because the sacrifice reveals Noah's heart his heart toward God. And God says, I can work with that. I can do something with that. I want to make a covenant with you when you have, with, with that kind of openness and desire and, and willingness to have relationship with me. But it always comes on God's terms. I mean, there are times in my life where I say, God, I want that relationship with you as long as I get to define the terms of the relationship. I suspect you might know something about that. But if you're going to have a relationship with Almighty God, He gets to make the terms. Because it's only on His terms that it leads us to shalom. It's only on His terms that it leads to restoration and it leads to life and joy and all that we were created to experience. And sometimes it's hard because following God isn't always exactly what we want. Jesus himself says, you want to be my disciple? Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. That doesn't exactly sound like a picnic in the park. I think there's something of that in the way God then says, okay, here's the sign of my covenant. It's a rainbow. I'm going to put a rainbow in the sky. And that's the sign that I'm making this covenant with you. But you know, I've been thinking about that, and it's interesting to me that for all intents and purposes, when it comes especially to a a, a natural rainbow, you have to have water. There has to have been water. You can't see it real clear in this picture, but the pavement is wet. It's just rained. And water is the very thing that is connected to the flood. And so God's promise of his covenant isn't to remove the thing that might cause them to worry about the flood. Instead, he ties it directly to that possibility and says, are you going to trust me? I have this feeling that for a little while, every time 
Noah and his family hear thunder, they twitch just a little bit. Every time they see lightning, every time they feel raindrops, it, it makes them a little bit nervous. Not to mention, rain may come one day, two days, three days. They got to be thinking, you know what? Noah says to his sons, look, go back, check on the ark, make sure that it's tarred up and the oil's ready because we may need to use that thing again. You know, I have, um, throughout the years of my life, I've seen a number of Alfred Hitchcock's movies. You know, a lot of them are iconic, you know? North by Northwest, Vertigo, Rear Window, Strangers on a Train. One of the movies I had of his that I had not seen was The Birds. So a year or so ago, I decided I, I probably should watch this movie. Everybody talks about it. You know, it's, it's spoofed in things. I probably should watch this movie. I watched it, would never watch it again. And if you haven't seen it, I wouldn't encourage you to watch it. Uh, you know, if you think about the freakiest thing you can think of that's going to freak you out, then that's probably what this movie's going to do. Um, the only thing worse is if it was called The Snakes. That For me, that would have been the only thing worse. <laughs> With the birds. And, you know, so you watch this movie and you're like, wow, that was freaky. A couple of days later, I'm out walking the dog along the road and there's this, this field of brush and growth and, uh, growth and stuff. All of a sudden, about 200 blackbirds just come flying up out of there. I'm going to tell you something. It freaked me out. I was ducking and covering my eyes and you don't understand that if you've seen the movie and it just freaked me out and for a number of weeks every time a bird kind of popped up I twitched and, and jerked back and I suspect that's a little bit of what Noah goes through and I think if, if it's me I'm thinking God just remove the threat why does the why does the sign of your covenant have to be connected to the very thing that lead, led to the flood I want that removed I want the possibility of anything like that happening removed. I want life to be easy. And for some reason, God says, that's not in your best interest. As an individual in the world, I, want, I don't want you to follow me because life is easy. I want you to follow me because you trust me that I'm going to be faithful. And every time it starts to rain, they look at each other and say, God, you're going to be faithful. And every time... He is. And maybe that's why, maybe that's why the, the, the covenant is so visible. You know, it's interesting too that, that every time they look at that rainbow, they're going to remember. But you know, that's not what God says. God says, every time I see that rainbow, I will remember. Every time God looks at that rainbow, he says, I will remember. I hadn't seen that for a long time. And God says, I'll remember, not because he forgets, but because we do. He doesn't say, I'll remember, because we're not sure if he's going to see us in our need. It's because we need to know that God sees us in our need and that he is remembering us. And every time they look at a rainbow, every time we look at a rainbow, we are reminded God remembers his promise. And he will be faithful. You see, God's not making a covenant. He's not doing something that he's trying to then avoid. He's not making a promise that he hopes his people will forget. He's not making a promise maybe like we used to do as kids with our fingers crossed behind our back. He's putting it out there as visibly and commonly and universally as you could imagine. Because that's the kind of God he is. And it is a universal promise. He doesn't just make this covenant with the human beings. He makes it with all of his creation. All of it. He says that two or three times in this passage. I'm making this covenant with all living creatures, with everything. Because God cares about all of his creation. But he also says it's not just for Noah and his, and his children. It's for all people. All of the generations to come after Noah. 
And if Noah is indeed the only one who survives, then everyone who lives after him is everybody. And God says, I'm making this covenant with all the earth because God is always thinking about all the earth, all people. He says that to Abraham. I'm going to bless you so that through you I can bless all the nations. He says that to Israel, your kingdom of priests that stand between me and the nations of the earth that will draw them to me. It's what we hear from Simeon when he's in the temple and he holds the baby Jesus and he says this one is destined to be a light for the nations. This is who God is. All people everywhere. And it's for people who want it and it's for people who don't want it. Because God's grace is not determined by our reaction to it. It's his grace. And we can reject it if we want to. But that doesn't keep God from offering his grace. For the whole world. And I think we will be better Christians if we keep that in mind. I mean, ultimately, this story and particularly the covenant and the rainbow, are really about revealing the heart of God. This is who God is. He's a God who, who loves. He's a God who is willing to humble himself. He's a God who's willing to risk with people who, quite frankly, probably shouldn't risk with. But he does because we're that valuable to him and that important to him, just as Emily said in her children's sermon. We matter that much to God. And this is not, and the covenant and the rainbow are not, are not the way of saying to God, this is how you should act. They are rather saying to us, this is who God is. You think about Isaac Newton, you know, in the story of, whether it's true or not, I don't know, sitting under the tree and the apple falls and, you know, thinks about gravity. He doesn't discover gravity. It's not like before that apple falls, there's not gravity, and he goes, oh, I found it. He just learns how to describe it mathematically. And it's like the, the person that called into the radio station one day, I think this was in Wisconsin, and said to them, I have a complaint. And they said, what is it? They said, I don't understand why the government puts deer crossing signs on the interstate. That's the worst place in the world to put a deer crossing sign. The traffic's going fast. Why would you want to route the deer across the interstate? And the guys on the radio are trying to contain themselves and not just burst out laughing. And they try to explain to this person, they don't put those signs there to tell the deer where to go. They put the signs there so that the drivers know this is where deers go. You know, it's not as if the deers are going, uh, yeah, we can go here, sure, let's go. All right, we'll run through. They aren't, they aren't directive, they're descriptive. And the rainbow and the covenant are not directive to God. They're descriptive of who God is. This is who God is. And all of this points back to Jesus. All of it points to Jesus. I can't help but think that Isaiah has this rainbow and a covenant in his mind when he writes, oh, we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And that Paul has this in his mind when he says, Jesus Christ, you being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he gave it up. He became a human being, a servant, and humbled himself even unto death. And that Jesus himself says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might know eternal life, might know relationship with its creator. Because our sin and even our rejection of God doesn't cause him to distance himself from us. Rather, it causes him to get right down into life with us. 
into the mud and into the muck and into the mire in order to redeem us out of it. And this is the God who says, I want to make a covenant with you. And here's the sign. I'm going to put a rainbow in the sky. When I was a child, I think about four years old, about the age of our grandson, my uncle came to visit us one time, and he brought with him um, a new record album that he had just bought. Now, I know that albums are coming back. I saw some in the store the other day, but you know, they, everything was an album then. And it was of this gospel artist, Mahalia Jackson. And he put that album on. He said, you have got to hear this. It's amazing. And he put that on, and it was one of the most amazing things I'd ever heard as a four-year-old. I loved it. And, a, and there was a, a particular song on that. I didn't know much about Mahalia Jackson at that time as a four-year-old. I've learned since what a phenomenal influence on the music world in this country. She brought gospel music black gospel music into the mainstream of life. She was extremely popular in the 19, particularly the 1940s and 50s and 60s. I think she died in 1971. She often sang at Billy Graham Crusades. She was closely connected to Martin Luther King Jr. In fact, on that day at the, when he spoke at the mall in Washington in 1963, she had sung earlier, and as he stood up to speak, she kept saying behind him, Martin, tell him about your dream. Martin, tell him about your dream. And he did. And I'm a little four-year-old listening to this album, and there was one song that particularly grabbed my fancy. And when that song would come on, I would dance all over the living room. Here's a song that was titled, God put a rainbow in the sky. And I never have forgotten that song. And in fact, I loved it so much, my uncle gave me this album. I still have it. And this morning, we're going to play Mahalia Jackson's arrangement of God put a rainbow in the sky. But we're not just going to play it because I want us to sing with her. It's a little bit repetitious, but I've discovered God kind of likes repetition. Scripture seems to repeat itself a lot. And I think that's because it takes us so long to get what God is saying and to believe it. And there's one particular phrase that I want to draw your attention to in this song. Mahalia Jackson, as famous and as popular and as powerful as she was in the music world, had a hard life. She had a hard life relationally. She had a hard life living through the racism of our country. And I have a feeling that there's this phrase in this song that was especially meaningful to her. And when I hear it, I think about that. And it's this phrase. When it looked like the sun wasn't going to shine anymore, God put a rainbow in the sky. And that phrase keeps getting repeated over and over in this song. When it looked like the sun wasn't going to shine anymore, God put a rainbow in the sky. And I don't know what kinds of things today feel to you like the sun's never going to shine anymore, but I want to tell you that's why I want us to sing this with her today. In the middle of whatever that is, I want us to remember, to see, to hear, to proclaim, God put a rainbow in the sky, and he keeps putting rainbows in the sky, and we can count on it. God is faithful. So I'm going to invite you to stand, and we're going to sing together.